This is we're also live on our Facebook page. Good, beautiful, good, beautiful Wednesday evening, guys. Welcome back, or Thursday evening, shall I say. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Hey, Adam G, your online queen inspirational talk show. And the Miss Earth 2022 festivities is about to begin. And I am so happy that the pageant system is finally going back to its traditional format starting this year after being sidelined by the pandemic for the past two years. And already, a lot of the contestants are packing their bags as they leave for Manila in the next few days. So I am so blessed to be interviewing one of them, one of the more than 80 delegates coming over here in Manila for Miss Earth 2022. Actually, you already know her because you've already seen how brilliant and intelligent she is during the intelli preliminary intelligence judging the past during the past few days. And right now, I'm so fortunate to be given an opportunity to get to know her better this time on my platform. So here she is live all the way from Malaysia. Obviously, please say hello to Miss Earth Malaysia 2022, Dr. Kajel Ko. Hi, doctor. How are you? Hi, how are you? I'm doing amazing. And that was such a nice introduction. Thank you so much. How are you? I mean, first of all, thank you so much for allowing me to interview you at this stage of the competition, considering that you are so busy thank you thank you so much for taking the no, time the pleasure is all mine thank you so much yes um for so guys as you all know as we all know as as i said earlier during my introduction she's really intelligent she's really oh, brainy when she good. showcased it to when she showcased it during the intelligent preliminary intelligence judging the uh, the past uh the other day or the other night or a few days ago so how have Thank you, you been so since that moment yeah because everyone everyone is saying you're one of the girls who really stood out in that segment of the competition from the continent of asia and oceania to be very honest uh it's very humbling and when you're in pageants for so long i think there comes a point where you just tell yourself um you're going to be yourself 100% and no matter what questions come don't really over prepare for it because then people can tell that it's not really you so going into this I just told myself no matter what question comes along just speak from your heart and I am so happy that people could see that it was very humbling <laughs> yes yes yeah we're finally being given the chance to see how amazing you are as a contestant yeah. for this yeah. year's edition. So for the benefit of my viewers, like PJ Amores, Facebook user Rin, Rin Park, and Ali Tepavong, who are watching us from different parts of the world or Asia, like Hong Kong or Philadelphia, oh, and wow. Kuwait, and Lao, can you give and can you share a little intro about yourself? Oh, absolutely. In terms of age, and, yeah. Absolutely. And, and thank you so much to all of you who are tuning in from all around the world. Um, it's it's so nice to know that all of you are here. My name is Dr. Kajal Kaur. I would just love if everybody can just call me Kajal Kaur. I am 26 years old and I come from Ipoh, Malaysia. So Ipoh is a very, very beautiful town in Malaysia that is surrounded by greenery and mountains. So one can the main reason why Miss Earth 
really captured my attention so much because I have been surrounded by so much greenery my entire life. And my main advocacy this year is actually to help the stray animals, the stray dogs in particular in Malaysia. Because in my country and in my state, unfortunately, there have been many, many stray killings that have been happening. So I chose Miss Earth for my advocacy. I've always wanted to join a beauty pageant. And when I learned more about Miss Earth, I just knew that it was the one. I'm an only child, which explains a lot as to why I have so many pets and why I have, well, basically grown up around animals. And that's all about me. Wow. Wait, so I can imagine your household, you're being surrounded zoo. by lots of pets. Yeah, it's a zoo. <laughs> it's a zoo. And you're living by yourself. Oh, no, I'm living with my parents. Oh, gosh. So what if your all your suitors come or visit you in your house? They'll, they'll have to be someone who's also pet-friendly or someone who loves pets. Oh, they have to. For but you to get there. Yeah, but all my pets are very well behaved. And to be very honest, they are extremely spoiled. Like my dogs don't sleep unless I turn on the fan for them. So it's it's a it's a real show that I put on for everyone when they come and visit the house because they're like, you have this and you have that and you rescued that. So it's nothing short of a zoo and people actually find it very entertaining when they come to my house. So how will it be how will it be from now on? You'll be leaving for for our country for the entire month for almost three yeah. weeks. Yeah. So <laughs> Who so will my parents look are after home. your dogs? <laughs> yeah, so my parents are home, and uh, well, that's why it's so convenient that I live with them still. I love my parents, but I also love the fact that when I do go anywhere, they are there to look after my pets. And if we all have to go somewhere, there are pet sitters who know me so well already at this point that just know that the moment I call, okay, yeah, yeah, this many dogs need to be taken care of, right? Okay, okay. So they already know the drill. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Thank God for our parents. No, who will really yeah. rescue us or will be know. here for they us. They tolerate the my session. <laughs> <laughs> so are you excited to come here in Manila again? <laughs> I am. Actually, I really am very excited. When I first came to Manila for my training with uh, KF, I didn't feel homesick at all, which was very surprising to me because I thought, you know, this is the first country that I'm visiting after the pandemic. So I'm definitely going to feel homesick because I've been at home for two years-ish and I've not left the country. But the moment I came to the Philippines, I felt so at home. So when I was there, I, I just absolutely loved it. And then when I came back, I actually started missing the Philippines, especially the people. Because everybody is so friendly in the Philippines. It's like everybody's like, good afternoon, ma'am. Hello, po. It's like, it's, it's overwhelming in a very good way. So now to come back to the Philippines is double the excitement, actually. Why did you choose our country to be, to be your training ground for Miss Earth? Oh, definitely because of the fact that, one, I have many, many friends in the Philippines. So going to the Philippines is basically like visiting a big, large family that I have over there. And secondly, the track record that KF has is amazing. And after reaching the academy, you learn why it's so amazing. So that is why I chose the Philippines and specifically KF to, to train at, actually. How is it like training with Sir Roger? You know what? He's actually a very relaxed person. And um, he calls me Doctora. So whenever <laughs> I train, yeah. So whenever I train and I do something well, he's like, okay, hey, good job, Doctora. And then you know, like, no, no, Doctora, not like this, like that. So it was very, it was like getting trained by your actual uncle. That's how it felt. He was that warm and welcoming. It was amazing. Mm, how many days did you stay here last time? About a week. I was there for about a week. Not enough, not long enough for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you were you able to hit everything? 
for the for the catwalk training? Oh, I definitely have to touch up a little bit more when I when I return. So I'm going. I'll be arriving a few days earlier. So that will be when I will visit KF once again, and we'll touch up on everything that um, has not been completed yet. Mm, I can't wait to see you. So you know what makes me excited to meet you in the flesh two weeks from now is the thought that you know you are making history in your country. When you oh. got crowned last April, you are the first Malaysian of Punjabi descent to ever win the title. So I wonder how <laughs> must it have felt like for you to get that achievement? It was it was a very big deal. It was a very big deal. Um, it did get a lot of coverage as well for the fact that I'm the first Punjabi Malaysian to become Miss Earth Malaysia. It was a very important thing for the community and representation is something that I find very important. So to have this platform and because many people, I was very surprised that they didn't know what a Punjabi was, not in Malaysia, but overseas. So I had to like, you know, explain to them that, you know, there's a, there's a state in India where Punjabis come from. It's called Punjab. And well, my great grandparents decided to come to Malaysia so I'm a third generation a third generation Malaysian Punjabi so it had that's when I realized how important this was because I am not just representing myself I am now representing an entire race of people and then what made it very easy uh, to the to the pageant fans was I actually explained to them I was like oh um okay to put this into perspective Harnas calls Sandu and I are of the same race. Then they understood, like, oh, okay, okay. Then I had to explain that my name has a core in it. So, Kajal Kaur Gil, Harnas Kaur Sandu. So, whenever you see a core has a middle name that is a girl of a Punjabi descent. Oh. <laughs> Actually, the first time I heard of Punjabi was last year because. Uh, Shri Sadi, Miss World America, who went uh -huh. on to, to place first runner-up in Miss World last year, is also of Punj Punjabi descent. So she was very mm -hmm. proud of it. And she also had a photo up with Harnas when they met in New York. Great. Like, it's, it's so nice to hear that, actually. And I'm so happy that, you know, I get to showcase not just Malaysia, but Malaysian Punjabis to the world. Yeah, I you know listening to you right now, it feels like, you know, Miss Earth fits you like a glove. You know, why, why, what made you choose Miss Earth? Is this your first pageant to join? Uh, no, actually, this is my fourth time joining a pageant and it has always been Miss Earth. <laughs> yeah, can you explain why? What, what is it about Miss Earth that well, appeals mm, to girls like you? Ah, so in 2014 was my first introduction to Miss Earth, and I joined the the state level competition in my province, and that's when I walked away empty-handed. I got a subsidiary title, which was Miss Energetic Para, which I will never forget. And then in 2015, I actually won uh, my state title, Miss Earth Para, and in, I took a pause for a little while. Uh, in med school things got a little busy. And in 2019, during medical school, during my third year, um, I actually had the opportunity to join again. So I joined in 2019. I actually won the pageant in 2019. So um, a day before my, actually not a day, like, it was a few hours before my flight, I actually had to announce that I could not participate because my, there were, my, uh, legally I was advised to not proceed at that time for my own safety. Nothing to do with the international organization, but it was more of an internal thing here. So it was very heartbreaking. It was many, many hours of uh, watching dramatic, uh, sad movies and eating a lot of ice cream to get over that. But my advocacy continued because that was why I joined the pageant in the first place. Because my whole advocacy, basically my life revolves around it. To be a medical doctor is, and to join a pageant, there's a lot of stigma around it as well. So to push through that and tell the world that 
hey, a woman doesn't have to choose one thing. She can choose both. And I also have different passions besides medicine. I also really love dogs. And this pageant can help me end the the abuse against stray animals here in my country. I can make it, I can be in, in on a platform that allows me to change the laws in my country where you can no longer kill dogs for no reason. So I persevered and after medical school, that's when I decided to represent Malaysia as Miss Earth Malaysia 2022. So there were a lot of uh, ups and downs, but giving up on this pageant would mean that I'm giving up on myself and my advocacy, which I really did not want to do. So that's why I'm here this year. And I'm glad <laughs> you made it through. Yay! Look at you now, right? Representing Malaysia in one of the biggest pageants in the world right now. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I just thank God every day for it. I just thank God every day. So, you know, as I read your bio, you have been advocating for so many things. You, like you mentioned earlier, animal rights, and you're also an advocate for food waste reduction. Yes. Yeah. So was it about, uh, how did it all come about for you? Okay, so as a Punjabi and a Sikh, my religion is Sikhism. What I learned about um, like food in general is that we, you know we love to serve food. That's a yes. very Punjabi and a Sikh thing to do. Whenever there's any natural disaster, you know we all come together and we serve food. In India and in most places around the world, in our religious um, temples, our gurdwaras. Food is served almost 24 hours a day to everyone. So let's just say that serving food um, is mainly, like being Punjabi was the one that really instilled that love for serving food in me. So when I saw that the dogs needed food, the stray dogs needed food, that's when I said that, you know, these two can go hand in hand because there's a lot of food that's being wasted. Like I see caterers in very, like, you know, catering for very large, big events. But at the end of the day, a lot of food goes to waste. So there's a lot of rice, there's a lot of meat. And we can actually do something about that. We can feed the stray dogs instead. Because some of the strays in, in Malaysia look so malnourished. And because people, you know, do not want to take that extra time and effort to go out and get for them food. You have food at home. You have food, you know, from these events which are still really good. And it's good excess food. It's not food that has gone bad. So why not feed a hungry uh, creature instead of feeding a landfill? And feeding a landfill will only create more you know, gases that are going to be emitted into the, the atmosphere, which is not good for the environment either. And when you over harvest food, that's not, that's not good for the planet either. So it goes very hand in hand, these two advocacies, actually. So in a way, for me, yeah, I, I like what you said, because it feels like, you know, food waste is like the solution for, you know, but I still feel bad about it because, you know, when we feed stray dogs, we usually, you know, our first resort is our food waste, our leftovers. Of course, there are <laughs> uh, canned, canned goods for for, for our pets, but normally the first go-to food that we serve or feed our pets is usually our leftovers. Don't you think that kind of um, says about how, don't you think we're kind of victims of speciesism? What I would say is that that's why I would prefer to, you know, collect good food rather than scraps of food which is actually not as healthy because then you're just giving the, the dog, you know, like bones and etc. But this one, you get good food, like really good food. And it hasn't gone into, you know, anybody's mouth. It hasn't touched anybody's fingers yet. So you're giving that to the, to the stray animals. And that's okay, actually. Rather than them going completely, uh, like, you know, starving themselves and going to bed without going to sleep, not even a bed, going to sleep without any food, at least do that. So it's like a small act of kindness that everybody can do. So in a way, your love for animals brought you to be aware 
of this environmental problem that we have. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Without, how do you think, how do you feel that now that I'm um, listening to you more, I realize I feel guilty. Like every time I eat, I need to consume everything. So there will be no leftovers. <laughs> yeah, because as I read in the internet, food waste accounts for 8% of our climate change problem in the world right now. It does. It's actually it part of the you're you're absolutely right and it's actually one of the un's goals of uh, you know combating climate change to reduce the food wastage that's actually happening right now and in my country malaysia it's a food heaven so we have so many races here we have the malays the malaysian chinese malaysian indians malaysian punjabis so we have all these kinds of uh, amazing food and unfortunately, we also lead Asia in the number of um, obese people, which is not good. Yes. So not wasting food. You don't necessarily have to take that much food in the first place, which is actually really good for your health, not just the environment. So it comes very full circle, actually. True, true. You know, how is, how is the food waste uh, programs there in your country right now? Like um, here in the Philippines, I don't know if it's if it's um, if it's also if the if it's if you guys are also doing it there. You know, us here there is there is some sort of culture or practice that we do when it comes to food waste. Like we actually, you know, preserve, do some preserving or probably even fermentation of our food, especially when it comes to our veggies and fruits. Oh, I mean, we, we do have our, our fair share of pickles here in Malaysia. But when it comes to composting, I feel like we don't do it enough, for sure. There's, there we, of course, we have um, recycling bins everywhere. We have a lot of good initiatives, actually. But when it comes to food waste, I think it's because we are a country that's so rich with food that we are focusing more on the food than the aftermath of the food. So a lot more can be done. So that's why I feel like this platform is so important to my country because it not yeah. only just gives awareness of like, hey, there's a pageant called Miss Earth and it's not just a beauty pageant. It's here because there's a message that this particular candidate wants to send out. And, you know, if she brings that back to her country, there can be a lot of difference, a lot of changes in her own country. So that's why this platform is so important because there's not enough being done in that area for sure. You know, um, true, true. And I'm glad that you're spreading awareness about it. But going to back to your food waste um, advocacy, don't you think, you know, we really have we really have to be blamed for this, especially in, uh, in our own simple ways in, you know, consuming food? Because let's face it, if you are, let's say, buying food, or let's say mm -hmm. all these... Um, raw or fruits or veggies from the supermarket or even in the wet from the wet market we tend to buy those fruits <laughs> which look fit physically pleasing you know what i mean or physically regular I unlike, if, unlike if you buy something that looks so irregular in size you know you will definitely you know, some of those fruits will definitely, of course, the, the the consumers like you or me won't buy it. And so it will be rejected to the in the grocery shelves. So don't you think in some way, you know, we choose that is aesthetically pleasing because we don't want to buy something that is quote-unquote ugly. That's probably the reason why, you know, there's so much food waste. You know where I'm coming from? Oh, absolutely. Actually, that's a very good point that you raised. A lot of us actually choose our fruits and vegetables because it looks aesthetically more uh, pleasing, whereas something that may not look as great is actually just absolutely fine. And I learned about this uh, this year, actually, when I collaborated with the Lost Food Project, which is a foundation that it's, it's an organization in Malaysia that's actually spreading awareness about exactly that where they are actually trying to tell people that, hey, this food or this potato or something may not look 
aesthetically pleasing, but it's actually still really good. And for the food that has not been consumed, start composting, which everybody can do. I see. You know, I suddenly, I suddenly thought of this. Why not? If the farmers already know that this particular fruit looks like, you know, irregular, is already quite rotten. Mm. Uh, probably it wasn't picked or harvested or picked or ripe at the right season. Maybe they can already, you know, transport it immediately for the composting. So yes. it could still benefit our environment in some ways. That's a very good idea, actually. So there's like so many things. There are so many things that, you know, every tier of society can do to help. So from a consumer, do not overconsume, and do not be too greedy when you take your food because don't fill up your plate and then, you know, waste fifty percent of it because that's not going to be good for your wallet or the environment. Mm -hmm. And from a retail perspective, you can start composting before the food gets bad or before it gets rejected, which you just suggested. And so, yeah, there's like there are many levels that we can actually help. Yeah. So, yeah. But you know what? Everything that we say right now will be irrelevant. Let's say if we buy, <laughs> if, if we apply it to the seafood to the seafood or even the raw meat section, as long as we find something fresh, it doesn't matter how it looks like because it's fresh. Human nature. Right? Yeah, human nature. Or if we see some stores, you know, offering overripe products at a reduced price, we'll still grab it. Because ah, it's really that's true. Which is why at the beginning, I remember when I was uh, newly crowned, there were a couple of articles that managed to cover this, which I am so happy about. Because I mentioned and even came out in one of the radio stations in Malaysia that I said, why not adopt laws that other countries have, like France, where you are not allowed to throw good food that has not been sold away. So instead mm -hmm. of you know, just throwing food away, why not? Then you have to are uh, obliged to donate that food. So that's also another good idea that Malaysia should and can adopt. True, true. So, you know, and out of those ways that we are talking about, a large chunk of it is really organic, right? You notice that. And a large portion of it is food. So how do you think, in your own way, can we suggest that we can reduce this percentage? Sorry, the line isn't so great. How do you, how do you suggest we're re reducing? How do you how do you suggest that we reduce half of the organic waste, which a large portion of it comes from food? Oh, so on a consumer level, what we should do is not over buy in the first place, which is really good for you financially as well. And if you do have excess food that you do not know what to do with, and you don't want to just throw it away, which is going to end up in a landfill, it's not good for the environment, then it is very easy to obtain a composting bin. And then, you know, you can morally feel very, very good about yourself and you are actually doing something good for the environment. So just don't overconsume and get a composting bin. Mm, true. So how do you think, you know, we've been talking about proper waste manage proper food waste <laughs> management for the past few minutes already so how do you think this can lead to achieving environmental sustainability it's actually just this itself on its own is actually already a method to achieving environmental sustainability so it's one small step that everybody can practice so that itself is really going to be very helpful and it's something that everybody can do actually and in a country that's going to be that is so rich with food it's something that we should do because a lot of our food goes to waste in malaysia a lot of our food when i read certain studies it said up to about you know 40 percent or 30 percent of our our waste is actually food waste in malaysia so it's a very big problem that we have to tackle and if we tackle this we're also 
you know, directing the country towards living very sustainable. Yeah, I hope that's why you know there are girls, there's Miss Earth for for you to amplify your platform. Yeah, yeah, it's so important. It's so important. And Miss Earth is the one platform that I know can actually send out my message. And a lot of people did um, did ask me this as well. Like, you know, you're a doctor already. Why do you need to to be in this kind of a spotlight highlighting this topic? But it's actually very relevant because overconsumption of food is a very big problem that medical, uh, you know, people in the medical field have to deal with. I myself had my own fair share of uh, weight gain issues that I needed to solve medically. So I know what obesity and being overweight can do to your body. So being a doctor as well, this is something that I'm very passionate about. Do not overconsume. Because the cascade of events that can actually happen to you is not something very pleasant to go through. Yeah. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree. And apart from food waste, from advocating for food waste reduction in your country, you know, as you had said earlier, that's where this is just an offshoot of how you love animals. In general, in your life. So I wonder, how did it all begin for you? How did your how did your love for animals begin, or when was the first exposure that you had when it comes to animal cruelty? Okay, so my first exposure to animals, specifically dogs, actually, um, started when I was a baby because my parents had two dogs even before I was born. So I grew up with my dogs. And I remember there was an incident. Um, there was an incident in my house where my parents told me that they actually caught me with a bowl of ice cream, and I was feeding my dogs ice cream. And I think I was only about four years old at the time. So mm-hmm. that's when they realized that okay, our daughter really loves these dogs. So it's something that I cannot pinpoint as to this exact moment made me love animals. I grew up with my dogs, so I grew up loving them, and it didn't. I didn't realize how important they were to me until I reached my like uh, my late teenage years. Because to me, my dogs were always just there. Like you know, they're just part of the family. They're just there. They're pets. Okay, they comfort me. But then when I reached 18, 19, that's when I realized that I cannot live my life without a dog in it. And then when I reached my early 20s, I I would still consider myself young, but (laughs) when I reached my early 20s, that's when I realized that during medical school, which is such, um, it takes a lot of your mental strength to, to go through medical school, but I got through it because of my dogs, because they were there. So whenever I was stressed, whenever I was, you know, at a point of breakdown, I could come home to my dogs and they were there for me. So I got through that phase. And then during the pandemic, there was so many, new, there was so much news about uh, people dumping their pets and so many animals that were abused. And at the same time, there was news about how people were coping because they had their pets. So it's so, it's such a contradiction. It's like animals do so much for us but we are not doing enough for them. In the medical field, there are therapy dogs. There are police dogs. There are, there are dogs in so many ways, so many fields. But we do not appreciate them enough that when we see a dog that needs help, we just close one eye about it. So that's why my advocacy is so important to me. And here, uh, because the population of stray dogs is very, very high, in my state alone, there are 30,000 stray dogs. So there are a lot of mass killings of these dogs as well that people just do not think about as much. So this platform, this Miss Earth platform, is mainly for me to say, hey, the laws in this country need to change. We need to stop uh, the authorities from killing these dogs. Instead, you can actually neuter these dogs and control the population and you can vaccinate them. You don't have to kill them to control this population. 
And I have never in my life encountered a situation where a stray dog has been aggressive towards me. It's usually the dogs that have been threatened or they are... Stressed, abused. That they are stressed. They attack people. Stray dogs that know you are going to feed them or you're just minding your own business will never attack you. So True. why should we be aggressive towards them? And when, you, when I came to the Philippines recently, I realized that the Philippines also has a, a number of stray dogs. So it's yeah, a global it's... problem. I have a question. Why, why, do, why in your country do they allow mass slaughtering of dogs? They do not. Uh, it's a situation that's a little bit... Uh, it's a sensitive issue for sure. Because we are not allowed to kill these dogs. But it still happens. And it has a population control. It's allowed. And some people who just do not like dogs, like just this year alone, I have read almost four or five uh, stories just in my state, just in my city, of 10, 20 dogs being killed and in one go. Like, you know, 10 dogs were poisoned here, 20 dogs were poisoned there. So mm. that's something that we cannot seem to find a conclusion for. And the only thing that needs to happen is a lot of awareness. People need to start reporting. People need to stop killing these dogs. And certain laws have to change. You know, I just realized with what you said, how do you feel that, you know, how, yeah. How do you feel about it? We are slaughtering, humans are slaughtering animals, but we are treating them humanely during their lives. Sorry, we are? Treating them humanely during their lives. We definitely do have to treat them humanely, for sure. Because, like I said, they do so much for us. I have seen so much kindness in the eyes of my dogs, in the eyes of stray yeah. dogs. So, but, you know, but I realize, you know, if you know, if they are serving a lot of purpose to us, you know, let's face it, dogs are very loyal to to their owners, to their bosses, and you know, they can really do a lot of things for us. Like they can sniff drugs, they can sense if something is about to go wrong. Like they can feel the earthquake from the ground if it's uh, if it's upcoming, or even like you know, a robber who might be lurking around in our midst. But you know, we can't fully grasp it. Yet there are some people who would really, you know, do inhumane what? acts like slaughtering. Yeah. So I really do not find that I really find that disconnect. Like, you know, um here here is one species, one kind of species that God gave us to protect, to nurture, to love, yet, you know. We al yet at the same time we allow other people to slaughter them. Exactly. So seeing this animal abuse just doesn't make sense to me because if a creature has done nothing but you know contribute to the human race, why should we kill them for no apparent reason? And if it's purely for population control, because let's face it. There are so many people that want pure breed dogs. So yeah. all these mixed breed dogs are the ones that usually end up on the streets. This is a fact. So instead of you know finding a solution for this population control by killing them, why not neuter them? Which is actually very good for the dog because then they save themselves from so many different kinds of infection. So new to them instead. And this is something that a number of NGOs have actually started practicing in Malaysia. So they, ha they all have like a five-year goal, a five-year plan, where they want to neuter the dogs to control the population and to also raise awareness on why we should actually save these creatures and not just kill them. Because there are certain housing areas in Malaysia that actually feel safer when there are stray dogs there. But when those stray dogs are killed, the how they, they do nothing about it. So it's very unfair. So even stray dogs that you do not keep in your house is actually protecting your neighborhood. True. That's how much the dogs do for us. 
So do you think now, you know, yeah, I hope everyone realizes that the life of animal is just as important as a human's life. True. I have actually started becoming vegetarian this year. So it's a, it's a very big step for me because I realized that um, I have to practice what I preach. So if I'm practicing animal rights, I should also limit myself so that I can talk about it. And to me, I would say that every animal, every life has a value, but as a human being, I will always you know, try to, because I'm a doctor as well. So I've taken an oath to always save a human save. life. First. Yes. But given a situation where, like, you know, given this platform, especially, where I can, in a way, save the lives of so many dogs without being present in every area, but telling people, please do not kill them, is a really big thing for me. So in my professional life, I can save human beings. And with this Miss Earth platform, I can save dogs in, in many, many ways. Yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, Rafa Delphine is watching us, your previous interviewer. Hi, Sir Rafa. Okay. He has a comment here. Neutering and spay spaying programs. Wait, let me show that. Neutering yes, that's my advocacy. program should be implemented in all societies where stray animals are rampant. The problem in that so many people continue to read some animals for money, adopt, and not shop. Exactly. I just I just love Rafa. He, he and I are we're on the same page when it comes to this. Yeah, you know, um, I read an article um recently you know he she's also like you an animal lover and she took it to another level by adopting a lot of dogs and pets dogs and pets dogs and cats that she sees in the streets and he, you know, he has a dog that has an instagram page as well he's just he's just wonderful with his dog he yeah. truly is yeah and she and he said that uh, uh and i and i read the art and i read further the article you know, um, the technique there is he does he doesn't allow all his stray pets to breed together. He just lets them be until they die. When they die, they start you know picking up stray dogs again in the street. Would you agree? So what you mean is like uh, don't mix your your animals, is it? And only get no. more pets after because because um. Because Critical Beauty Salon said adopt mm -hmm. and not shop. Or am I really understanding his perspective? So and I related to an article oh. that I and I related to an article that I just read where I where it's all about someone like you who's also an animal lover who also is taking who is also taking in a lot of pets uh in her home. But instead of ballooning, um instead of you know having so many pets, you know, she, she doesn't, um, it's actually something that she got from her parents that um, instead of making all these uh, dogs breed and propagate, she doesn't let them be. She just lets them, you know, uh, live until they die. And until once they die, then she starts accepting, she starts getting, uh, adopting stray dogs again. Actually, that's a very good message to send out as well, which, you know, only adopt the number of pets that you know you can handle. Don't over adopt as well. Like, you know, you want, of course, so many people want to really uh, contribute to this cause, but always only adopt the number of animals that you know you can look after. And if you do not want your dogs to you know, to reproduce, the best thing to do is to actually spay them. And there are certain NGOs here in Malaysia, and I have my own NGO, which I really hope that, you know, can really take off after this pageant, where I want to implement the same thing, where if you adopt from that particular NGO, you can get a discount for the surgery to neuter the dogs. So that's one way you can do it. And secondly, um, of course, you can always separate your animals when they are on heat. 
so that they do not reproduce. But in a way, it's healthier for the dogs, especially like, you know, female dogs, they don't get the uterine infections when you spay them. So spaying should always be number one. When you adopt a pet and when they reach like six months or a year, get them spayed. It's good for you. Uh, you don't have the headache of, you know, constantly worrying about your pets reproducing and it's healthier for the animal as well. True, true. So I want to tease you right now, since we're talking about animal rights, vis-a-vis -vis how we, we humans should protect them. If you could only, <laughs> let's, I'm making up a hypothetical question right now. If you could only save one for the sake of this question only. Okay. Would you save the life of a chicken or a baby? Uh, I would save the life of a baby. Why? One, because of the fact that, you know, in the, my instincts will definitely tell me to save the baby because of the value of human life in my eyes, not just because I'm a doctor, but, you know, to save your own is something that is very important. And if I have to save a chicken, I basically have to shut down every every food outlet in the world. So let's put that into perspective as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Talk yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, so now, I'll the life of a baby. I'm go I'll be wrapping up my interview in a little while. I'm so 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 enjoying our conversation about animal rights and welfare now and i'm really listening to how you know how you have been such an advocate a great advocate of it so how has your advocacies in all in all impacted or affected your life as one of my last few questions <laughs> To be honest, um, at the beginning, I was worried about sounding too preachy because it's, you know, when you're so passionate about something and something bad happens to that particular thing, you can become very angry. So I was very worried about sounding too preachy each time I spoke about uh, animal abuses and how we should protect animals. But fortunately, that has actually been a good thing for my life this year because now I am so known for this advocacy. Like even people that I'm seeing on the street, when I go for family gatherings, not just online, it's like a thing now that people know me for. Like, you know, Kajal really loves dogs. She's advocating um, for the rights of these animals, the stray dogs. Kajal has her own NGO. So I'm already known for it and it is something that i'm so happy about that i cannot really put into words because i guess when you love something with all your heart people really can see it and they take notice so i didn't have to get angry and you know really like oh no you have to listen to me when i spoke from my heart people actually listened which was, it's, it's so nice and it's, it's very, very humbling kind of feeling. So I thank this Miss Earth platform, even locally right now, because it has just changed my life so much. I'm sorry. Great message. Yeah, great message. You know, I'm sorry. I kind of, Rafa. I could have not <laughs> helped but react to, to Sir Rafa's <laughs> comment here. <laughs> if I knew that the baby, you know, he was referring to your previous, to my previous yeah. question. If I knew that the baby would grow up cruel and evil, I'd rather say the chicken. Sir Rafa really has a wicked sense of humor. I just, I love him. I love him. And I think for his sake, I I just might have to sing Jolene by Dolly Parton for my, for my talent round. Because it's something that, you know, he really wants me to do because I, I said it to him during the interview. So if I do uh, sing that song, I'm definitely dedicating that performance to Rafa. So what are the high chances that you will really sing that song on the talent it's, night? There's like a 90% chance that I'll be singing Jolene for my talent round. <laughs> Dolly Parton, right? Dolly Parton, yeah. yeah. I love her. <laughs> she has her own line for, for dogs now, dog clothing. 
Yeah. Oh my gosh. I hope you know the judges who will be judging you on the during the talent night will will get that point why you're singing that song. Thank you so much. So as to my last question, you know, you've been talking about food waste, um, animal rights and welfare. So for those viewers out there who are listening to us right now, who, what do you think are the other opportunities that are there for animal lovers like you to help out those animals that are in need? We are all doing it for our soul, to be honest. Nobody's really profiting from saving animals. If you do it, you're doing it because you really love animals. And God bless you for that. Because people like that are very hard to come by. Because most of these um, shelters, etc., a lot of volunteer work, a lot of you know, self-initiatives. So for people like-minded, I only pray for you. And I know how difficult it is to see all the animal abuse that's happening at the moment, not just in Malaysia, but around the world. Stay strong. And we know how much dogs have done for us. And the day will come when any, uh, any kind of animal cruelty will definitely be put to a stop. So have faith. Have a lot of faith. Yeah. And I also want to share that adopting a pet if you don't want to be, you know, to lead to animal cruelty, to, for us to avoid animal cruelty in the process, it's a lifetime responsibility for yeah. commitment. The mere fact that we're abandoning or ne neglecting dogs, there are stray dogs in the streets existing, yeah. is already a crime itself. Yeah, that's why my NGO is called No Strays on Streets. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the basic thing is just just love them. That's what I'm getting for you from this interview. Just love them, care for them, provide for their basic needs, and don't keep them in cages 24 7 yes. Oh, yes. As much as you can, please do not cage your animals. Um, unless, you know, you have to maybe, if your your pet cannot be, uh, you know, cannot sit still in a vehicle, then yes, transport them to the crate. But as much as you can, please do not cage your animals. Please do not, you know, tie your animals. I've been seeing a lot of cases, a lot of the news reports currently in Malaysia where people are tying their dogs in their houses and then going on long vacations. So that has happened in Malaysia a couple of times where people just do not care enough. So please, if you're going somewhere, make arrangements for your dog to be looked after or bring that animal with you. And do not just leave them abandoned, not just on the streets, but in your houses. Well said. Well said. On that note, thank you so much. I can't believe we, we, we have been talking for almost an hour. That's how engaging you are as a guest as you talk about your participation in this year's edition. Thank you so much again, Doctor. I can't wait to finally meet you in person. I can't wait um, to meet you. 10 days from now, yeah, for the press presentation happening in Ocado, Manila. So safe travels here and see you soon. I had so much fun getting to know you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It has been a pleasure talking to you. And I'm so happy that, you know, viewers like Rafa were there. Thank you so much for watching and giving me this opportunity. Thank you. All right. See you soon. Take care. Virtual hugs and kisses for now all the way from my office here in Manila. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye.